Welcome, everybody. Um, I hope this conversation is going to be fun, it's going to be entertaining and informative. We have two of the most amazing engineers I know, and they happen to be female. But they are great producers, great uh, musicians, both musicians, both are great engineers and producers. That's Kato Zane from, from San Diego. Well, she's not from San Diego, but she lives in San Diego. Yeah. And Chrissy Tignar, who was with us last year too. The whole point today, let's talk about things. Let's talk about uh, music, technology. Let's talk about any questions you might have for 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 them. Let's see what, what, what comes up. Um, so let's let me give you a little intro. So Kato, I met I well I saw her the first time in Pro Studio Live. Mm -hmm. That was a, a that is or was I don't know I think they are revamping. Yeah, they they kind of switched. My understanding is they switched more to Spanish language stuff. Ah, okay, so that's a one of the, those websites for technology and engineering and produ production, like uh, Pure Mix and um, Mix with the Masters, the, those kind of things. That's the first time I saw Kato. Then we met in person at NAM before COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> years ago. <laughs> yeah, years ago. That seems like so long now. And yeah. So <laughs> and Chrissy, I know um, I met years ago too, but she, it was in the, well, we didn't make it in the Dominican Republic, through the, the conservatory in the Dominican Republic. Chrissy is a great musician too. And she built a recording studio for the, for the students at the conservatory in the Dominican Republic. That's how we hooked up, let's say, in, in this environment. So hopefully you researched both of them before this meeting and we can actually start working with questions and things. I'll start with one just for fun and we can go from there. Then anybody can, if you have a question, please put it on the, on the chat so I can, we can go from there. So I'm, so I'm playing banjo. I, I think somebody was actually. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, girls, take us back to the, that day when you said, I want to work in this crazy audio world. <laughs> Whenever that was. What, how, how did that happen? Who goes first? <laughs> Pick who you want to answer first. Who, who of us? <laughs> Either. Okay. Um, well... So for me, I think it was, let's see, it was probably high school. I started, I was in, you know, bands with my friends. It was like punk bands, stuff like that. Nothing like big deal. But um, I always did better in math and science type of uh, classes. And I realized some, at some point, I realized that you could combine the math and science stuff and with music and not be the one that's in front of everyone performing. And I loved that. And I also love, you know, like sound textures and, you know, weird noises and stuff like that. So I think that's what drew me to it. I don't know if that's a good answer, but. Yeah, anything is a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same kind of start, actually. It's a very similar story. Um, uh, when I was in high school, I actually was really into like music videos and like video editing um but it was like really old school back like vhs's you know like <laughs> loading them onto the the computer and like you know manually just like chopping stuff up but i really like technology and i loved music at the same time i just didn't want it same thing i didn't want to be a performer really i didn't want to be an artist ever i just really liked being behind the scenes um and yeah the way that it sort of happened for me is actually my mom strangely um she knew that my mom was a math teacher she uh is very much and she was a science teacher before same thing math and sciences i was pretty good at and when i knew i wanted to study music but i didn't want to be a performer because i i actually was a woodwind player previously so i played clarinet bassoon um but i knew i didn't want to do that and she was looking at the school i wanted to go to which was the heart school of music if anybody's heard of it and she said like okay well you could go for performance but that's not really what you want but she was looking it up with me and she saw music production technology and she was like okay you really like the video stuff you're on the morning news i was literally like an anchor on the morning news at school <laughs> and she's like you love all that stuff you love the video but like this is music but it's also technology and she was the one who um 
who really inspired me to, to get started. And that's when it all began for me at the heart school is where I started to learn. I was also in a band too. It was a jam band though. <laughs> and I played synthesizer. <laughs> nice. Which you still do. I do. I still have the same synth actually <laughs> since I was in high school. Yep. <laughs> now growing up and trying to be, uh, to become what you are today, how, not how hard, that, that would be kind of a too open question, I guess. But how did you get into, you went, you went from that moment where you wanted to do it to I am doing this. Uh, how did that happen, you mean? Yeah. Do you have a mentor? Do you have people that helped you through it? Whatever. Um, well, for me, I, I went to uh, school. So I went to Connecticut College back east. Uh, I studied music and technology, economics, and computer arts and technology. And so then while I was uh, in school, I forget, somebody helped me get a job uh, at a local theater. So I started doing live sound stuff, and it kind of just blended from there. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. What about the move to, to, the, to, the, to the West Coast then for you? Oh, so like a few, I think a year or so after graduating, um, my husband and I, well, we were dating then, but we just decided that we should move. And my family's from San Diego. So I have like cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents here and stuff. Um, and his parents had moved to San Diego already as well. And so we were like, well, that's kind of a big city. Um, let's just go for it. So we, we literally just got in the car and moved, uh, without any plans. <laughs> we did a road trip and it wasn't very, uh, it wasn't very planned out, but it worked out. So, yeah. Um, my, because, oh, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> it was crazy, it, it was kind of the same thing. You are living in, in, in LA now, from the East going to the West. So how, same question for you, of course. But. Sure, I mean, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't always on the East Coast. I mean, I'm born and raised in New England. I'm from Massachusetts, but um, after when I finished college and it was in my final year of college at the Hart School, I, it was 2008. So it was like the big financial crisis. And like, it was, I just started to freak out because I was like, how am I ever going to work? <laughs> so um, I actually ended up um, going to do my master's in London in the UK at the University of Westminster, because I thought, okay, if I can find a way to move out of the US and go somewhere else, like maybe I'll have more opportunities. Um, because I was really worried about the economy and like what that meant, like working in music. So I, I, um, I just went to the UK, literally got a master's because I wanted to move to the UK. I didn't really want a master's. Um, I didn't love school that much, which is hilarious because I ended up being a professor, but um, I <laughs> didn't love it. But I went over to the UK and I did a master's in audio production. And that really set me up for like my my success working in the industry. Um, right out of college, I started working in studios in London, um, working with artists. And uh, I noticed really quickly that like production specifically at that time, so this is like starting in 2009-ish, um, production was a huge thing in producing artists that were on like studios, um, you know, uh, list of artists and like who they were publishing. Uh, there was a lot of demand for that. So I ended up sort of getting into that industry even though I loved engineering more than anything I wasn't really into production but like I started to realize that the work and the way to make money was to like do pop production so that's really where I started um, and I was working in London um, for four years and I also worked at a promoter at one point <laughs> for a venue which was also kind of cool uh, but that's how I got started and then yeah I mean to come here to the west coast I just moved in July of last year I was at um, Berkeley teaching for um, eight years actually in Boston and I got really tired of the cold so I came here and it's been fantastic in Los Angeles nice and sunny not today strangely today's actually cloudy but that rarely happens <laughs> nice uh, guys if you have any questions um, put it on the chat please and then we'll go from there <laughs> well you can you can read it right yeah Sorry, that, that was long. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good question. Um, so I, I personally went to college and I feel like 
I screwed up in college, to be honest, with some of my knowledge, because I um, had this idea in my head that like, and I was really stubborn, I probably still am, but um, I just had this idea that I was never going to write my own music or like have to worry about like copyright and stuff. I was like, I'm going to be an engineer and that's all I'm going to do. So I don't have to care about that. And I actually failed music business in my master's <laughs> because I was like, I don't care. Like, this is really boring. And um, so like I did go to college and I did learn a lot of stuff about like engineering and everything. And I have two degrees in engineering and production. Um, but the biggest learning like moment for me, especially like what you're saying here was about music business. And like, I didn't pay attention when I was in school and I learned the hard way. I would say like, I went through a lot of like bad contracts. I got taken advantage of so many times and that was like a real challenge for me. So I ended up doing a lot more, um, like self-study in this. Um, I, I worked a lot when I was at Berkeley with another um, faculty on in like the music business department, like one to one to sort of like pick their brain and <laughs> figure out like what I was doing wrong and like how I could get better, you know, with these situations or like fix any bad contracts I'd already been in. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say like a lot of mentorship was really helpful for that, um, for music business particularly. Um, in regard to online sort of like education, I, I honestly think there are so many different ways to get this type of education now. YouTube back a few years ago was like huge for me, especially when I was trying to learn more about like certain subjects that I didn't quite understand. Um, but now I feel like even on like TikTok, it's ridiculous. Like how much you can learn even just like tiny bite sized stuff. Um, so I don't know if that really answers, but like, yeah, mentorship, like working one-to-one, -one, like I think that really makes a difference because then you can focus exactly on like wherever the limits are in your skill set. And I definitely got that um, with this music lawyer. So, so yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> well, uh, let, let me interject here for a second. Uh, if you, I guess you looked them both up and both of them, Chrissy and Cato have a lot of stuff on, on everything on online, a lot of little things. Cato has a lot of uh, short videos on many different things, pro tools, technology, all that stuff. And Chrissy does too. So check him out just in case. Cato, I'm sorry. Keep going. Um, is it my turn? Should I talk about it? <laughs> Okay. Um, so, I mean, I guess there's two things here in this question, right? There's um, experience, like building your career and experience stuff, and then there's learning stuff. And I think they're both kind of tied together in a lot of ways. But um, for one, I know a lot of the jobs I have gotten has been someone that I've currently worked with recommending me to other people. So uh, that's a big thing for career building is to keep in mind, you never know who might be able to recommend you to someone else. Um, the other thing, I think some of the biggest ways I've learned has been just uh, assisting in the studio, um, just learning from people that are, are already doing it. Um, yeah, and Pro Studio Live is actually a big learning experience for me because they would bring in uh, you know, oftentimes multi-Grammy winning engineers and we'd learn from them. And that's a big part of why I took that gig. I was terrified of being in front of the camera and I'm like super awkward. This is just really weird that I have a YouTube now, but um, I was so terrified. It's so awkward, but I was like, I cannot turn down this opportunity to learn from these people and like be in that room. So, um, you know, just, I don't, I don't know if that completely answers the question. Um, the other thing is it's, it's the type of thing that I feel like you, you're always learning. You want to keep learning forever. Um, and that doesn't have to be in an academic environment. I, I loved the academic environment, but, um, you know, just looking things up on YouTube and stuff like that and learning from others and, and joining, you know, groups and stuff to chat about audio and music and whatever it is. You, it's, it's, there's so much depth to it. You can really just keep learning forever. I think. It's funny that you mentioned that it, a couple of weeks ago, I was in the in a Grammy, uh, San Francisco Grammy uh, meeting, and it was a close meeting, of course, but it's funny how what you said, pretty much everybody was in the same boat. It's mm -hmm. like, we are all learning from each other, even at this stage. We never yeah. stop learning. I don't think it stops. No. Yeah. It, it's, there's no point in stopping. 
no if it stops if you if you feel like you've completely done it and it you know it's then it gets boring so you know we pick topics like this to study because you can keep going forever i think yeah exactly any other question um well chrissy said something on, on the chat she asked you can read it so check it out check it out um so let's go to another question one of mine then I have a few things, not many, so I can actually open for everybody else. Equipment you can, can't live without. That's a big topic, but whatever comes to mind. Huh. Um, I mean, I don't have a ton of equipment here. <laughs> so it's like all my equipment. I don't know. Um, or plugins or whatever, whatever. Uh, Chrissy, do you have any? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, what I can't live without, I I would just have to think of what has always been like by my side throughout my career, and that's my synthesizer. <laughs> like that's my most prized like piece of equipment. I've had it since my my parents got it in Las Vegas in a pawn shop, and they brought it home for me, and where they were like, here, like I we don't know what this is or how to use it, but like take it. And it came with me to the UK, it came back to Boston, um, and now it's here with me in LA and we took it cross country and I just, yeah, that's my, I can't live without it for like, um, you know, sentimental reasons too. Um, but I'd also have to say like, I would have to say my like laptop. I know that's like really basic, but like you can do so much just on a laptop, even if you don't have a bunch of other equipment. And like, I've, I've invested in my setup here, like to be what I want it to be. Um, however, I would have to say like just my Sony headphones and my laptop, I can get a lot of stuff done with just that. I don't even need all the rest of this, so. Yeah, I had to get my laptop repaired recently and it was gone for like a week and I felt like I was grieving. Like I was, I felt disconnected. It was like the heart of my studio was gone and I was so sad about it. And I have a backup, but it was like not the same, yeah. I, I can't imagine that. I, I know we talk about it, but I can't yeah. imagine that. It was so, it was so struggle. But like, I, you know, I teach at a college too. So I went in there a couple of days and got some work done. And then I used my backup laptop and it, it I got through the week somehow, but it was stressful. It's very stressful. I'm currently on my iMac here. So I have an iMac for my studio, um, but then I have my laptop and I had it sitting under this mic and I knocked it, the oh, mic, yeah. it fell out shattered the whole screen of my laptop oh, no. <laughs> this mic. I was like, yeah, so I feel the pain. It's like nothing, nothing like losing the laptop when you use it all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, rough. Um, I think my acoustic treatment too would be a big one for when I'm using my monitors. It's a big one, makes a big difference. I think well, people kind of explore that. From there, then. Um, show us what you have, what's your <laughs> studios? Um, you know, like the, everybody here wants to see, you know, the, coming with this, I mean, of course, when you go to the school, we have a huge, you know, professional full blown studio, and we have four other studios. One of them I just built with an SSL, um, Excel desk and super cool stuff. But that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, I can't talk much because I have a lot of money here in this room. But I you don't need all this to to produce music and that's the point you you can do it with a lot less today and uh, it would be cool to have to to see what you have and then you can talk about about it to everybody you want to go first kato um sure i guess uh let's see so i'm i'm on my laptop now so i'm not sure how much i can like actually move this around so let me know if i start like disconnecting or something weird um but this my studio is just this is my home studio, first of all. So I am in, it's like a small two car garage. The house is from the fifties. So it's like a separate building, but it's it's just a little garage that's been um, renovated, I guess. So I have some windows. I have a window to my left and then one behind the desk as well. Um, and the, the building's been finished out. So there's like insulation and stuff. And there's a wall to, to my right that splits it into two parts. So this part that I'm in is the bigger part. And then there's like a little, unfinished hallway type of thing where I have a whisper room in there. Um, and then let's see, I guess you can see behind me, I got my sofa, I have some GIC 
uh, standing bass traps, acoustic treatment. Uh, sorry, I'm like trying to look at where I'm pointing. This is also acoustic treatment. It's that bunny art tape up um, gig acoustics as well. Uh, piece, I guess you could call it. And then I have, let's see if I can move this without it disconnecting. I have my piano here. I have some guitars and other instruments here. Um, I play the ukulele for fun. So I have a bunch of ukuleles lying around. That's my electric ukulele. Um, I have some acoustic treatment. This, the, where am I? There's a window right here. I have another gig panel that's like on that window because there's only one window on my left and no windows on my right. And it was kind of like skewing uh, my, my uh, monitoring environment when I'm using the monitors. Uh, let's see, what else? I have my theremin somewhere back here. I, have, I don't know if you can see it. Um, and then I have an attack wall behind me. So uh, I'm not sure if I can really show you that, but there are pictures of that online. I also have some YouTube videos where when I was setting up the space, I um, made some, some YouTube videos of that. So you can see more detail on that if you want to check that out after this. Um, but other than that, I have an Apollo interface. I have like uh, Great River preamps, uh, a Neve compressor, uh, hearback headphone system, um, a bunch of Furman power conditioners. I have an old 11 rack, some DIs. I don't know what you guys are interested in hearing about. I have a Cali N8 monitors and then the Mackie MR8s, which I've actually had the Mackie since college. Those were like a gift from my parents. Um, and then I just recently installed some ceiling panels. Let's see if you can see them. So there's one there and then I have two there. <laughs> so um, that's one of my recent things is the ceiling panels. And I still have to do like some calibration stuff to see how that affected it. So I might move them a little bit more, but um, yeah. Does that kind of answer the cool. question? Do you have any questions on that guys, anybody? I have a gear list on my website too. It's ketonoise.com if anyone's curious. I don't know. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've got my little thing here. Hold on. Let's see if this works. I don't know if you can see the camera. <laughs> Woo. Okay. So I don't know how much I can do without like running away from the mic so you can hear. So I'm going to sort of like give you a little, a little look, see, and then talk about it. So we'll see if you lose me here. Um, that synth on the top is the famous synth I've been talking about. It's a Roland XP30. I've got like a, a Hammer 88 M Audio um, a MIDI keyboard as well. Um, this is my main setup. I'm just going to back up for a second. So you can totally see yourself, I'm sure. And let me just move this light. These are my um, my preamps. I've got four SSL um, channels. I've got a Neve Warm Audio. I've got a Phoenix DI and uh, a Joe Meek channel strip, which I just, I don't know. I always wanted a Joe Meek. I love the green too. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of different um, synthesizers as well. Uh, this is like a um, Gabe Smith uh, monophonic in uh, synthesizer. I got my little, obviously my M, what is it called? Uh, Akai MPK Mini. We've got, hopefully you can see this. Um, this is a Sensil Morph Mini keyboard, which is pretty cool for MPE. Um, I've got obviously another Apollo, Apollo X16. Um, I've got a little Lexicon Reverb. This is a tuner up at the top. It just looks kind of cool. Um, and then like, yeah, over here, you can kind of see the whole vibe, I think. Hold on. There we go. I don't know if you can see that here. Um, this is like the other side of my space. Um, and I've got like carpets and stuff. And then like, this is a little vocal booth behind me. Um, and yeah, that's a basic setup. I've got Cali Audio um, speakers as well. Wee! Hello. <laughs> um, and that's basically that. Now, hold on, let me come back and I'll talk a little bit more about it. Oops, sorry to make you dizzy. Um, yeah, uh, that's my setup, but like I'm in my living space. That's the other thing too, I should mention. Um, I, uh, am building a tiny house on wheels. That's going to be a studio and that's going to be my studio. Um, so that's in progress right now. So eventually like I'm going to kit that whole out, you know, the whole thing out with everything I've got here. Um, but one of my biggest like inspiration slash mentors is Sylvia Massey. And if you don't know about Sylvia, you need to go check out Sylvia 
as soon as possible. She's amazing. Um, but I did a course with her for Berkeley Online, and it's all about experimental recording. And because she's like really out there, we put audio through a pickle. We uh, <laughs> did all sorts of weird stuff and, and we did a whole course on it. And when we were working together, we actually went out to Ashland, Oregon, where her studio is. And I had no idea that she had a fully open studio, like no acoustic treatment between where her control room is or her, you know, her big console was. And no, nothing, like no separation with the band. And she always recorded an artist right next to her without separation, just right next to her. And I was like, all right, if Sylvia can do that, I'm just going to like create a space in my home that is like musical and everything has a place, but like we can record just right here. So this is actually where I record all the vocals that I do, whether it's, you know, me or somebody else, um, just right over next to me. And it's cool because then you have that direct communication. You don't have to use the talk back with anybody. It's just like a lot more intimate. And I learned that from her, which I really like. So she's part of the inspiration for this setup, actually, um, that it's all in this space. So eventually I'm going to have my, my little tiny house studio, but, um, that's what the setup up is for right now um and yeah uh the cali audio monitors i think you know kato you can answer this too like i love these i used to have some atoms and uh they were good but like these i really like them and for the price like i love finding like most of my stuff i should mention too it, most of it is secondhand even my mics and stuff um not this one this is one of the few that's not secondhand because i wanted this color but um a lot of it is secondhand. I like to like upcycle stuff. And, um, you know, uh, we were talking a little bit about like the project in the Dominican Republic. It was a similar idea um, of like donated upcycled equipment. Um, but yeah, a lot of this stuff is upcycled and secondhand. And I like to find really good deals without like breaking the bank because it's totally possible to do that. So like Cali Audio, yeah, thumbs up. Love them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love them too. Oh, and Reverb's your friend for used, used gear. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I have, you mentioned Adams. My, I have Adams here actually, and uh, they are. Of course, I didn't buy the, the super expensive ones because it doesn't make sense for this room, and they are not 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 too bad. And they are, I mean, they are great and not too expensive. Let's say, and River is great for a lot of things. I just got two uh, Apex two hundred fours. I don't know if you remember those. Those are old old school. I got two of those actually from River like like a couple of weeks ago. My students know because I told them I told them when I bought them because my wife didn't know about it. <laughs> um, so uh, that goes to your question, Connor. Actually, I think I hope that helps. Uh, he's asking about how do you get um, equipment mm -hmm. to start because you know it's it's they are expensive, of course. The way I did it is I. Um... I slowly started buying things and I was assisting and then working in other people's studios. Um, and I was just buying things the whole time, really, really slowly. So a lot of this stuff I've, I've had for a long time. Um, and then, you know, at some point you start getting a little more momentum and you, you can get more gear and, uh, it kind of takes off a little bit at some point, but it's, uh, it's tough. Yeah. I think like if you, think about what you really really need day to day and like start there that's the best place to start because a lot of you know when you see a bunch of like hardware and you're like oh i have i have a, an apollo and i'm using an, an external like hardware preamp and it's going into an external compressor and da, da, da. all that stuff like a lot of times you don't necessarily need that right away like for example the apollo interfaces have like the what are called the unison preamps so you can have like a virtual version of some of these hardware um, pieces of, of equipment which of course is not going to be exactly the same as using hardware but like that works really really well especially if you're on a budget like for sure it works really well um and i think yeah building it over time because it it takes a long time like i have been building this over the last like 10 years and now i have you know eight pre's right i would love to have 16 to go into my apollo x 16 eventually but i still don't have the other eight because i'm building slow so i think that like as long as you're not like blowing all of your money on a bunch of things that you don't need <laughs> then yeah you're gonna be really really set up for success i think what everybody needs though in audio just generally you need some sort of computer you need uh, a pair of reliable headphones for sure. Um, 
I think you also like if you really want to get serious about stuff, have a nice, you know, reliable pair of monitors. They don't have to be super expensive. Like we just said, Callie's a really great um, recommendation for that. And then like your interface and a mic, even just one mic, you can start off there. Figure out which mic works well for you, like what sounds good on you. Like you can try if, if you have access to a studio, you can see what what um, sounds good on your voice. There's also secondhand stuff, amazing. But then you have like companies like Warm Audio who make these recreations of classic gear. And it's honestly like, I mean, seriously, the Warm Audio 87 sounds really, really, really good, okay? Nothing's gonna beat a Neumann U87. We all know this, it's like, you know, a classic. But um, but the Warm Audio version is actually really good. And I think that you can you can absolutely get away with spending money on, you know, things to start off with and eventually build up to those bigger pieces of gear. But yeah, you don't need a lot to start. And you don't, you definitely don't necessarily need all those extra little bells and whistles that we've just talked about. Um, but maybe you do, <laughs> maybe eventually. <laughs> yeah. I, I totally agree about like the whole prioritizing it thing. Like when I, I only moved here um, to this location in August. And before that I was in my condo and I, I kind of had a similar setup to what you have where it's like a big open space and it was like a loft. So there's a drop behind where I was sitting. And um, what I did it there is I was, I knew I didn't have enough space to have like the whole recording side of things really. So um, what I focused on was acoustic treatment and stuff that would be, help me with mixing. So good headphones, acoustic treatment, stuff like that. It's, you just think about what you're going to be doing and then try to kind of triage it. So for me, I was like, well, I can start doing some mixing remotely before I can start doing, you know, other things. So let's focus on the, the gear that helps me mix remotely, if that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, Connor, I think also not thinking about buying, like, like, both of them said about buying everything at once because that that is not going to happen. I mean, I've shown you my studio and you've seen it, but all of this gear is being little by little. I mean, some of these amps I have here have been with over 20 years and some of the mics I have have been with, with me over 20 years. And then, of course, at some point you decide go, to go crazy and buy stuff. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> and then you're in debt for the next five years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's a, there's a, there's a good question here, actually, uh, from Elijah. What tips do you have for networking and meeting new people in the industry? You want to go first? <laughs> sure. I'm like really awkward. So like, I'm not very good at networking. Me too. <laughs> uh, I gotta be honest. Um, I tend to be like, I, not shy, but um, I don't know. I, I just am not that good at like if I'm put in a situation where it's exclusively, exclusively for networking. So like an event that's just about like meeting people and stuff, I start to like get really weird and I'm like, um, but I do think that social media, I know love and hate social media, but social media makes a huge difference. And it's finding the social media, whatever type of social media you like to use, but finding the one that works best for you and connecting with people that way. I can't tell you enough how much that has, has helped me, um, just like through social media and what you post. Um, and people start to get to know who you are if you post consistently, they, if you use hashtags that, that folks are really interested in. Um, you know, and things like TikTok right now, like you can, you can really, if you can figure out that that uh, formula of like using the right hashtags or doing the right trends or like that sort of thing to bring attention to you, like as a creator, not just like as a musician, but bring attention to you and what you do. That's a real advantage that I think a lot of folks um, should take advantage. They should take advantage of it. Um, social media makes a big difference. And um, I also think that like, um, if I go back to the beginning of my career, like how I got started, this is pre social media. So right now I'm like social media, social media, amazing. But like I got started pre social media, there was just like Facebook at the time. And Facebook was not like that. It was very much like for college students, like when it started out. So um, when I first got started, I actually cold called every studio I could find in London. Like I just went through, I Googled cause Google was there. I Googled every studio and production company that I could find in London and I called them all. Like, and I pretended I knew who I was gonna 
talk to. Like I pretended they were expecting my call. I'm like, hey, can I speak to Joe, the studio manager, please? And they're like, oh, who's this? I'm like, yeah, my name is Chrissy. I'm just uh, calling to uh, discuss poten- like working together or I sent an email. I'm following up on the email I sent, et cetera. Um, and you wouldn't believe how successful that is because people are afraid to call on the phone, especially more now. Back then it was weird. It's weirder now to call. Um, and I think that like you don't necessarily have to get on the phone with people, but I do think that there's an advantage of like putting a voice or a face to a name because people start to remember who you are. Um, and like Cato said too, like a lot of the work that I got was word of mouth from other people, um, referring me to certain things, but most of those connections started by me just being really bold and just reaching out to people that I knew would not care what I had to do, like what I was doing with my life. Like they didn't probably had no idea who I was, didn't care, but it worked because it got them in the room with me, right? So this was all pre-COVID too. You know, we always have to take those considerations, but I would get these people on the phone and I would ask to set up a meeting on the phone and just say, hey, I'd love to show you my work and see if we can work together. Um, Can we set up a meeting in person? And like when you got them on the phone, it's hard for them to be like, I actually know I'm not interested. Like most of them will actually meet you. And if you can get in that room with people so they hear your music so that you're there in person talking to them, I think that makes a difference um, more so than just a DM. DMs work. They do. Like you can DM people. Um, but yeah, I think just going that little bit of an extra it definitely helped me. Yeah. I don't know, Kater, we might have a different um, no, I <laughs> opinion. Totally agree. Um, I think like DMing, it's you're fighting through a lot more noise to get there. So yeah, I totally agree. Um, I had a thought and then I lost it. Uh, oh, oh, another thing that to add to what she's been saying is um, like things like discord groups and meetup groups are great too. If you're not going out there in person, um, those are great ways to kind of join some kind of community that's interested in, you know, music or audio or, or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, for me, creating my YouTube channel was partially to cultivate that kind of uh, you know, just don't be afraid to show your enthusiasm about the topic, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. And I know, Kato, from the YouTube channel you have now, you got, you've been getting a lot of fans, including uh, working with Warren Hewitt now. When yeah. He was like a pro. Yeah, that's been a lot of fun. So uh, I've started creating content for them and with them and, you know, for their channel and for my channel. It's been a lot of fun. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't really make my own music. <laughs> um, I do have like one track on Spotify, but it's top secret. So, uh, I don't really, I don't really make my own music. I, I just tend to work with other people and help them make their stuff. So I have some, um, I have like a portfolio thing on my, on my website on it's catonoise.com. You can go check that out. There's like some sound design, some other stuff. I ha- I need to update it though. It's kind of old. But, yeah. Which takes us back to the beginning again. I mean, once you get into in this industry, there are so many things you can do. Being a performer, a composer, a musician is one thing out of many. Mm-hmm. Um, if you beca- become an engineer, a producer, a mixing engineer, which is a different thing now, before, if I engineered something, I mixed something. It was like the same day, usually in the studio. Now we can do it. I can record it and send it to somebody else to mix and then somebody else to master. Uh, but all of these little jobs now are available to all of us more yeah. and more, I think. And it's really helpful to learn the difference between all these little jobs too. I know that it's kind of like a spectrum and, you know, what people call a producer can vary, for example, but um, it can really help to, to learn all the differences. Definitely. Um, so no more questions here. Let me go with another one. We have Sarah off who is our professor of music business. Actually, she came right on, on spot with the networking question. <laughs> Good thing you missed my comment about how I failed music business. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone fails music business and then they figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so let, what about, since we are talking about different, different avenues in this environment in the same in the same boat let's say but many different places um 
you have any any advice you could give to future producers, engineers, particularly the girls in here that might be interested in that? Because you got you have a perspective that I don't have in this in that in that environment because i of course we know we know it's a male dominated environment and i'm male so but you have something that you can offer that i can't but i even if the more i want um i think maybe just you know try to find people that will help build you up instead of view you as competition i think that's a big help um, I think that's like the attitude to have, you know, there's, we can all help each other because we're all into the same stuff for a reason, you know, um, it can be tough though. You know, I've had, I've had people, uh, I've had people want to fire or let's see, how do I describe this? I've had someone's girlfriend want them to fire me because they weren't used to him working with girls in the studio. Um, and there was nothing, there's no reason for her to worry, you know, I'm married, I'm happily married, but, um, just be aware of that stuff too. There's like the whole mentorship thing for, um, it can, it can block you if you, if you don't find people that, that are willing to, to help you out anyway. I feel like I'm rambling kind of, but, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of times people that succeed in various industries, it's because they find a mentor that can help them succeed and if you're trying to get into an industry where people don't look like you for whatever reason then you're less likely to find people people like to mentor people that they kind of view as like a earlier you right like a younger you so it's it's less likely that people will pick someone who looks different from them to mentor them and that's not to say that no one's willing to do that but it's a I think it's a big obstacle to overcome, but I mean, we're getting more and more women in the industry. I don't know if that went completely off topic. No, that was really, it's a good point. The mentorship thing is like game changing, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's becoming more common than it was before. Like, I mean, all the way throughout, throughout school, like I didn't have any women teachers like teaching technology i didn't have any of that my best mentors when i was in school i had two amazing male professors that always encouraged me they happened to be younger too which always inspired me they were like closer in age to me but they always encouraged me and built me up um but they can't understand necessarily like the same struggles that being a woman in the industry like what that brings to your life um, and I think that like finding those people, uh, for me, they've really been, I already mentioned Sylvia Massey. Um, she was like a really instrumental for me to just kind of get over myself. Um, <laughs> Susan Rogers is another, um, incredible engineer. And I was fortunate enough to work with her at, at Berkeley, but I mean, she engineered purple rain. I mean, come on, like, how do you even i can't even comprehend that like how incredible that is right and she she really was such an inspiration for me too um and i picked her brain same thing with sylvia like you just even if it's not an official like mentorship like uh arrangement just talk to as many people that can understand your experience as you possibly can because it's not just going to help you understand your own experience um it's also like you're going to hear different perspectives from everybody like I, I feel like Sylvia and um, and Susan, who I just mentioned, both of them have been uh, like they both work with Prince. They have completely different attitudes about working in the studio and being a woman in the studio. Um, like that that's so cool to hear that like oh there isn't even a one size fits all because sometimes you're like oh well I'm the only woman in the room I have to fit and check the box like here we go <laughs> I gotta do things a certain way and be a certain way um but that's not necessarily true and the more you can talk to people who understand you um that that really makes a difference um finding community in you know other folks i think um there's a lot more out there um uh we are moving the needle as one uh she knows tech um 
Uh, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. She is the music is another one. There's a lot of different organizations that do really great work to just like empower women in this in this field. But we still haven't. No woman is one producer of the year at the Grammys still. But we're gonna get there someday. <laughs> um, I just think that like the more that we can bring attention to the fact, like I agree, like th things are changing. It's not the way it was even 10 years ago. There are a lot of women doing this. But yeah, seek out your mentors. That 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 reflect what you do um another really great woman that i have like picked her brain is amanda davis she is a live sound engineer for like janelle monet and i mean she's just she's front of house for these massive massive um shows and she's just incredible um so just you, you'll find these people doing this type of work um jenna andrews is another one if you um uh if you know her she's like the vocal producer for bts she did dynamite um which was a huge huge hit um talk to her she's amazing she even like might even respond to your dms there's a lot of people out there and especially like with women too like you never know who's going to respond to you like we're trying to create a community all of us at least in my opinion yeah and i was going to say something there because you know a lot of times we see we see people that are superstars and we think they are unreachable and most of them are not. I mean, on, on, once you reach them, they will probably respond to you. Not all of them though. There are some really not cool people up there, but there are many cool people too, that they just want to share what they know. Yeah, and usually if someone, I feel like if someone's really successful in this industry, they have to absolutely love it to have gotten there. So it's like, they're probably super excited to nerd out with someone, you know, whoever it is. So, you know, if you reach out to them and you're actually wanting to talk about production or audio or music, then it's, I feel like you're more likely to get a good response, at least. I just typed a couple of names in there, folks to follow, just in case you want some recommendations. All of these are just like, they're just amazing, strong women. Um, definitely give them a follow. Oh, and for organizations, uh, Women's Audio Mission, Project Traction, there's like, a, there are a whole bunch now that are really, really cool. Yep. And there's a question from, from Jack right before Chris's message. Hmm, failures. That's a good question. I, I don't. Who doesn't have the failures? Oh, I have so Like many. I'm constantly failing. So <laughs> like just failing ups really slowly. I don't know. <laughs> Um, avoid getting discouraged if it's something you really love, you know, then yeah, do it for the sake of doing it. Yeah, I think everybody's like failing all the time. And like, I just did a Q and A, I just mentioned her, Jenna Andrews, but we did a Q and A on discord, um, yesterday. Um, and this was one of the questions was like, like, how do you get like yourself back up after all the no's <laughs> and she goes there's gonna be a thousand no's and one yes and as long as you just keep gunning for that yes the one yes can change your whole life and i think that's important to remember i think like we've all had no's up and down like some of my biggest like frustrations in the industry how were because i wasn't paying attention about music business like <laughs> And all you can do from that situation is just learn from it, you know, and like try to do better in the future and try to keep learning. We talked about this already. Keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. Um, because the more you learn about your experiences, the easier it gets in the future, the the better it gets for you in the future. But if you're just like do, making the same mistakes over again, what is that? Like if you always did what you all you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. So like if you just keep doing the same stuff it's not going to work. But if you learn from those experiences and you try to like continue on, even if it's, you know, sad, if you go through like a bad situation, if you get a big no, something you were really hoping for, it doesn't mean it's the end. Like you never know what's right around the corner and that big yes is coming. So I, yeah, I, I think just keep yourself going, try to like look retroactively back on the situation and like also be critical of yourself. Like I made so many mistakes that I, because I wasn't like 
um, as informed as I should be, especially when it came to like contracts early in my career. I've said this multiple times, so I keep coming back to it, but that was the biggest challenge for me. Um, and I had to look back and say, well, what didn't I do? Like what, what mistake did I make to protect, protecting myself? And what do I do in the future to make sure that never happens again? So every collaboration I have is going to be healthy from now on, or at least as much as I can possibly control it. Cause you can't control everything, but that takes a lot of like introspection and looking at yourself and saying like, uh, what can I do better the next time? So I think that's how you keep going, like the failures. Like how can you avoid failure? You literally can't. You can't. But you can learn from the failures to do better in the future. Yeah. I think there's like a balance. It's, uh, you know, like you want to, it's like a practice. You know, you're, you keep doing it forever and you learn and learn and learn and try to improve. And part of that involves taking feedback from other people, right? That's great to have a community you can reach out to and get feedback and improve how you're doing, you know, whatever aspect of this industry you're doing. Um, but then the other side of that balance is you're going to get those million no's or you're going to, you know, so you can't let, you want to take the feedback, but you don't want to let it discourage you too much either. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's funny how that works. Even in when, when you're a mixing engineer, for example, and you make something that re you really loved. You think this is amazing. And then the producer listens to that and sends you a, a folder full of notes. It's like, oh, shoot. Now I need to redo the entire mix. You mm -hmm. thought it was great. But then you're learning, you're learning from your mistakes. Maybe you made a mistake and you didn't notice it. Or maybe just, you know, they didn't like what you did, which is fine. Yeah, sometimes it's preference too, you know. And also it's just like that goes to show how important it is sometimes to have another set of ears on something because I've definitely had this experience that I'm like, this mix is amazing and I've mixed, missed something because I've become completely like oblivious to it. And the artist will send it back and say, oh, can you, like, this is not sounding right. Can you address that? And a lot of times, even if like I don't necessarily agree um, it brings up a point that I probably would have missed um, because I've been listening to something over and over again. And especially if y'all are are producing, writing, recording, and mixing your own music, don't let it escape from your computer without someone else's ears being on it because because you get so lost in that I, I from my experience too like if I'm working on something that I've been involved in from the beginning without anyone else listening to it I think like yeah you have to have someone else listen to it especially if you started from the bottom with a particular song because you you start to get used to hearing things a certain way and it and it and it creates a barrier of how much you can how critical you can really be on it so always like don't be afraid of sharing your music with people and that goes also, sorry, sorry if this is a tangent, but um, <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to share it both with folks who have a really tuned engineering ear, but also just like everyday people, like find the best people to listen to stuff um, that you trust are going to give you good feedback. But that's not always like someone who's like, oh, 6K is too high, you know, like not always those folks, but like just an everyday person, like one of your friends who doesn't do music professionally, like send it to them, be like, how does this make you feel like do you, is it impacting you the way that you want? What do you, what do you think? And I think that's also a really helpful piece of feedback to have. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Any other question? Well, let me segue from there. Um, production ideas to explore for, for all of these guys and girls. Hmm. What do you mean? Like, Anything that comes to mind at that point, you say production ideas. What can I do to make it better next time? What did I do that was a failure, total failure, which all of all of us have been there many times. More than I like trying weird things. stuff. I mean, I like trying to think of the not standard way to do things and then try that and see how that sounds. And sometimes that's it doesn't pan out, but sometimes it's a lot of fun. Um, the other thing that I'll do sometimes, I don't know if this is really under this question but uh I will if I get kind of stuck or I just feel like you know taking a moment and kind of course correcting on something like a mix I'll go and like watch what other people are doing on YouTube or whatever to see to just you know brainstorm ideas and and go from there so that's a great way to kind of break things up 
Um, I also take frequent breaks so I can come back with a fresh ear. Yeah, like production tips to try. I say throw your biases out the window and like just try something weird and different. Um, like some of the best sounds I've ever created. Well, I say created that gives it away, but like they're like things that like I've done. Like I really I had a song that like I used like a bag of change as the hi hat, you know, like sampled it. Um and like that, I think sampling too is just like such a cool thing. If y'all are producers and like less on the, um, well, either more or less on the engineering side, but if you're producing and you're doing like tracks and, and, you know, creating instrumentals or producing an artist, I think that there's like something about like found sound that is so cool that like if you're creating a hi-hat, that's not really a hi-hat or like some sort of rhythmic something that's not a rhythmic instrument um those types of things work really really well or like even if you want to create like a melody and you're not really good at playing it on like a midi keyboard get yourself a kazoo and like hum it in and then process it with all sorts of weird stuff i mean there's so many different ways to like instead of just going in and just choosing a preset i think that that's a big thing for me like i don't ever want to leave a preset exactly the way it was <laughs> <laughs> when I found it, it's like just experiment with different ways to to process it. Um, run stuff through amps and pedals that aren't supposed to go through amps and pedals. Um, just get weird and and like even if you don't use anything from that day, like now you have done something different and you know what works and what doesn't. And sometimes you find something that, um, just by experimenting that works for one project but doesn't work for another. Um. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be expensive stuff. Like I have, I my synthesizer is my beautiful thing, but I literally have a Radio Shack keyboard here that I use, and I like just put my mic right here, just my Telefunken, literally by the speaker with some of the stupid, awful sounds that come out of this, and then process them differently. So I think that like, yeah, like it doesn't even have to be an expensive thing. Just like pick up stuff that you find on your everyday life. Like just experiment with different sounds because like everybody's bored of the same stuff. Do something different. Yeah. Nice. I, I love that stuff too. I have like boxes of junk that it's like it's it would otherwise some of it would just be garbage but i like like the sound it makes and i'll use you know that kind of stuff sometimes but um yeah i love that stuff i had someone sing into a singing bowl once for you know like an added effect on a, a music track that we we're working on um i did a video recently on youtube actually where we all the music elements except one guitar i think it was and the voice were just things that were in my garage here next to the whisper room. So it was like a skateboard and a propane tank and stuff like that. And I just messed with it till it sounded more musical. And it's it's so much fun. So much fun. That's pretty cool. So I have something really fun here, by the way. Love it. <laughs> I figured I would show my telephone microphone because this is another fun thing. And you can make this by, can you hear me okay? Are you understanding me on this thing? Okay. So you can make one of these if you have a soldering iron and like a battery. You can make one of these. Um, it's just, it's a telephone, literally. That's what it sounds like. And it's very fun. So try one of these. I love <laughs> of yours. That's so great. I have, a, I have one too. So that is pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> so we have, it's, it's 2.59 already. So it's, it's gone so fast. That's pretty cool. So you get, just got the cable in? Yeah, so um, you can make it yourself. I actually had a former student who started a company um, making these, and I found this at a yard sale, and I just gave it to her. Um, and I was like, hey, I really like the color of this one. Like, do you want to do a custom one? So her company is Carmine Audio. That's the little sticker here. Um, but you can do the same thing. Like, if you uh, have an old phone, you just take it apart. You just have to... Um, solder uh between the the wires of like the little capsule inside here it looks like this one of these and then you got like this on the back end of it you can kind of see just a little bit of like those wires so you have to solder them to a battery like a just double a battery and um uh solder between this little section here and your xlr and you can literally make one of these. <laughs> but uh, I, this one actually is custom by her, but yeah, you can, uh, it's a DIY project too. Just kind of like the way if you solder um, for a, like a speaker to reverse it and make it into a microphone, that sort of thing too. Yeah, 
There are a lot of uh, companies that make kits and stuff too for uh, gear. So that's another way to get more affordable gear is if you get into soldering and, and building stuff with kits. And Yeah, there are companies that, that actually also sell microphones and preamps and all that stuff that you can yeah. uh, which are, I'm, I want to try those actually. Those, are, those look cool. They're fun, yeah. So we have one more question and then we are done because I don't want, Jack, I'm sorry, I can't go to yours, to the last one. Uh, but Andrew is asking, what main recording software do you both use? I'm Pro Tools pretty much entirely. I use Pro Tools and Logic. I use Logic to produce and I use Pro Tools to mix and record. Cool. Now, and I just want to say to Jack really quickly, though, because like if your friends are just like whatever about your music, like then find people who appreciate. <laughs> That's all I can say. Like, yeah, find find folks that will appreciate it. Like there goes going to be those people who don't care. Um, and I have them, too. Like I could make the greatest song in the world and they're just like whatever. Um, but yeah, don't let that that group of people necessarily um, dictate how you feel about yourself. That's all I want to say. Sorry, I don't want to go over time, but I just want to say that. No, it's great. That's a, that's sure a great, of... great advice. Sorry, Sorry. Kendall. I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure some of my family doesn't even really know what I do, so that's fine. Same. <laughs> well, my family doesn't care. So, <laughs> well, ladies, it's been great. Thank you for being with us today, and guys. Anything you want to say to finalize the day? Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you all so much. I just left my uh, uh, social media in there for uh, if you want to follow, connect in any way. I'm Data Child, both on um, Instagram and TikTok. And Kayla, I'm... please do that. That's, do the same for them so they can they can follow. Okay. You. Yeah. I'm. Oh, let me see. Sorry, I'm full screen. I was gonna. Um, so I'm at Cato Noise on Instagram and Twitter. I think it's Cato Noise Official on Facebook, but I have a YouTube. It's uh, slash C slash Cato Zane. So um, I don't know. I can put some links here. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Come chat with me. Hang out. Yes. Come on over. <laughs> Thank you all for, for coming today. It's been great. Great talking to all of you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you yeah, for thank coming you. and thank you guys for coming. Thanks, Kato. Thanks, Greasy. It's been great again. I hope we can do it again next year or before that. Yeah, Maybe we can actually now meet in person. Oh my gosh, in person. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a recording session with my students today, actually. I'm doing a jazz ensemble for as a workshop. And I think it's gonna be the first time I'm gonna be in the studio in person with more people in a while. Yeah. That'll be awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Good luck and have fun. Congratulations to everybody who gets to be in person. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, ladies. Thank you, everyone. And uh, see you soon. <laughs>